Uh, thanks a lot, Laurent, uh, first of all, for the kind uh, invitation, for the very generous uh, introduction. Thanks all of you for your interest uh, on what, at least for me, is the only sunny uh, afternoon of this summer. So thanks a lot. Um, I've been asked to frame a discussion on how the concept of the circular economy can make us better managers uh, of water. I guess we can all very easily agree that uh, a circular and regenerative economy is the one way to decouple growth from the ever-increasing use of resources. And I guess we can all very uh, safely agree that in a world of nine billion, uh, every drop counts. Uh, that is a bit too much of agreement to have a good discussion, uh, I thought. And so let me start slightly differently. Over the next years, we need to stop saving water, we need to stop cleaning water, and we need to stop operating utilities. Uh, no worries, Laurent. Um, that is a very far out uh, end state vision. Um, and I think until we get there, uh, it will be uh, a very attractive joint right into that golden sunset uh, for all of us, for the business community, for the scientific community, and for the com community of those who are uh, concerned. However, we need to move from repair to redesign, and we need to move from costs to value, and that is the quintessential promise of the concept of the circular Economy. So I would like, um, with your uh, kind permission over the next 20 or so minutes, uh, talk about that joint starting point, uh, the direction of that journey, and uh, explore with you uh, how the water co sector can be in the middle of that transition. Before I get there, allow me to make three upfront uh, remarks. One is on sources, one is on the format, and one is on diction. Uh, on sources, uh, most of this is taken from my professional work as a, a partner at McKinsey. Uh, many of my clients and most of my work has to do with closed material loops and has to do uh, with water. Um, and <clears throat> uh, also more recently from um, my leadership from what we call the McKinsey um, Global Center for uh, business and environment. On format, during those uh, 18 years as a consultant, I grew allergic to PowerPoints, so uh, bear with me and uh, with the spoken uh, word. I hope that uh, works for you. On diction, uh, the circular economy is, uh, is an early or still very eclectic concept, uh, and uh, it so far has not really been codified into any uh, strict scientific definitions. Uh, on Wikipedia it says there are four principles. I would like to argue it really uh, is resting on one principle. Uh, it uh, translates into three very straightforward design rules, uh, and it has three very straightforward implications for business, uh, including the water sector. Let me step back and define what our collective starting point is. In the 20th century, we have built a fascinating and relentless engine of growth. Whilst population has uh, grown fourfold from something like 1.5 billion the beginning of the century to 6 billion at the end of the century, 7 billion now, soon 9, soon uh, 10 billion. At the same time, our economic performance, the global GDP, has grown 40 times from something like 1.2 trillion in 1900 to 47 trillion at the turn of the century. I think it's fair to ask what has been the drivers of that uh, development. I think there are four pillars, four drivers really. The first one is technology, and particularly that associated with the, with the second industrial revolution between 1920 and 1900. Uh, 60. The second one was the ever-increasing availability of labor inputs due to population gro growth, but uh, also due to uh, globalization as such. The third one was urbanization, which, if you think about it, really is a driver of uh, modernization and uh, productivity in its own right. And the fourth driver has been the ever-increasing use of natural resources, land, energy, water, and any kind of unpriced natural capital. 
So we need to ask ourselves, are these forces still in play in the 21st century? So technology, clearly, yes, technology will, of course, go on, and it is. Uh, most countries, as you know from your travels, continue to be on this side of the technology frontier. Um, population, uh, Asia and Africa, large parts of the world will continue to earn uh, the population dividend, so clearly, yes. Um, urbanization, yes, large parts of the world, particularly in Asia, continue to be in a long-drawn S-curve of urbanization. Um, the ever-increasing use of resources, however, has come under massive pressure, and that's why over the next 20 years we need to have a resource revolution. Resource revolution, that's also the name of a report that we created um, two years ago. Um, and we wanted to try to understand whether the model of the 20th century works again in the 21st century. Can we just repeat the trick? We looked very carefully at the supply side and the demand side. We wanted to know whether, in fact, the supply side will be able uh, <coughs> to out or to to keep pace with the supply side. And we discovered a very easy problem early on, that although we continue discover, to discover both on land and in the ocean floor uh, new and unconventional resources, extracting them is on average getting uh, more expensive by the day. Just as Ricardo had uh, predicted, we have used up this, the cheap stuff first. At the same time, and you all know that, demand is exploding. Today we are, and uh, Laurent was uh, hinting at that, we think we have something like 1.9 billion middle-class consumers. A middle-class consumer, according to our definition, is someone uh, with $10 purchasing power a day. Until 2030, we believe it's going to be um, 4.9 billion, 3 billion more. Just to put this into a, a historical context, from the beginning, of the Industrial Revolution in England towards the doubling of the GDP, that was 120 years, and it was on the basis of a population of 10 million. From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Germany towards a doubling of the GDP, that was 60 years on the basis of a population of 30 million. Uh, in China, it took 12 years on the basis of a population of 1.2 billion. So that's 10 times as fast, and that's 100 times as many people. So the demand shock on our resource markets is just historically unprecedented, and we firmly believe that in the future, resource prices will only know one direction. However, perhaps more importantly and more surprisingly, uh, it's not only the commodity prices, but it's also uh, the volatility and the correlation that have dramatically changed in recent years. Uh, volatility never in the last 100 years has the volatility of the basket of uh, agricultural, mineral and energy prices been as volatile as we have observed it in the last 10 years. And never have they been as correlated. Uh, today, uh, the prices of agricultural production and those of oil are 80% correlated, something that we simply did not know uh, in the past. So higher, more volatile, and more correlated uh, prices are clearly the one challenge for our economic and, as we know, ever since the Arab Spring, our political system. However, the scale and the speed at which we are depleting our natural capital might even be the deeper challenge. I know that in front of this audience, I don't have to be a lecturer uh, nor a missionary. And still, let us understand what collective risk we are taking. In terms of climate change, we are currently safely on track towards the 600 to 700 ppm uh, world, which is way beyond what scientists call the so-called uh, <coughs> climate safety threshold. Many tropical forests have, to the dismay of scientists, uh, flipped from a carbon uh, sink into a carbon source through uh, slash and burn deforestation and drought. Uh, and uh, scientists, in fact, see the possibility of a so-called Amazon dieback into, uh, uh, into a savanna ecosystem. Um, the recent work that uh, a team of mine and myself have done for the Global Ocean Commission at least opened my eyes at the devastating state of uh, global fisheries, where 80% uh, are either exploited or overexploited. 
Uh, and we are losing something like uh, 10 million uh, hectares a year in topsoil um, cover. And the current rate of um, species extinction is about 1,000 to 10,000 times of the, what we call the natural background rate. And after all, this is World Water Week. Uh, water, some, we are losing some of our major rivers, like uh, the Colorado River, or uh, some of the major bread, bread baskets of the planet, like the uh, Northern Punjab, in fact, is losing anything between one and two foot of groundwaters a year, and 50%, as we jointly found out in a report some years ago, of world population will live in uh, so-called deficit basins in 2030. So we have often had local resource challenges. But now we have a challenge that is both in course and effect truly global. And never before did we have to walk on a knife's edge between the legitimate call of uh, an emerging global middle class for economic participation on the one hand and severe, potentially irreversible environmental consequences on the other side. And falling off that knife's edge on either side will entail economic, social, and environmental consequences so far unknown. How to escape that predicament? We have essentially, we have three choices. One is around new supplies, one is around more efficiency, and one is around redesign. New supplies, um, possibly. If you take uh, water, however, in the 20 years between 1990 and 2010, we have been adding 900 BCM, billion cubic meters, of new supply, new water supply available to our economic users. Um, in order to meet business as usual demand increase over the next 20 years, 2010 to 2030, we would have to add 2,200 BCM. So that's 1.4 times the increment that we already put into the water market. And uh, who am I to tell you that we already live under extreme strain? So the second one could be resource efficiency, clearly. In the resource uh, revolution report, um, we have looked at 15 of the most uh, powerful efficiency levers from building efficiencies to drip irrigation uh, to intermodal shift and transport. Uh, and they, we think they are worth something like three trillion US dollars and it's a too big opportunity not to take uh, advantage of. Uh, we overall think that this could bring the resource um, uh, consumption down by 15 to 30 percent. Unfortunately, efficiencies uh, come with a snack and uh, uh, efficiencies are uh, asymptotic uh, and largely they are uh, compensated or um, uh, countered by so-called rebound uh, effects. And so the resource revolution cannot be, at least it cannot only be, an efficiency revolution. Efficiency is very important. It's buying us time, uh, but not more. So system redesign. Uh, we have looked increasingly at a third way to overcome the riddle. Um, three years ago, we, or more concretely, um, uh, I, got a, I got a phone call from a UK yachtswoman, Ellen MacArthur, and then we jointly uh, developed with her foundation a report in which we were asking ourselves the question, what would the economic opportunity of a circular and regenerative system be for the manufacturing sector of Euro Europe alone? We came back with the answer that it could be, uh, with not too wild assumptions, something like half a trillion uh, opportunity uh, in terms of cost saving for Europe's. Uh, probably uh, associated with uh, uh, benefits in terms of competitiveness and benefits in terms of uh, employment, simply because the circular economy is a more labor-intense economy than the linear economy. So um, there's very little doubt around the benefits of such a system. The question is how to get there. And that leads me to my second point how a circular economy must and will play out in industry, including the water sector assembled here today. The circular economy is quintessentially uh, a system that requires all waste uh, to be designed out of our industrial system in the first place. Uh, so all flows must balance out, uh, so you can't extract more than you return into the system at the same quality. 
Um, in a way, it's the translation of the simplest of all principles uh, onto industrial design uh, of the law of thermodynamics. If you are a phys physicist, uh, it's uh, the principle of fiscal prudence if you are an economist, uh, or it's just the uh, categorical imperative if you are a philosopher. Um, eliminating waste really out of the system uh, requires three design principles. The first one is that all durables, such as an uh, automotive gearbox, need to be reused, uh, never downcycled. The second one is that all consumables, such as textiles, uh, they need to be used in as many uh, cascades as possible, and then they need to be returned safely to the biosphere. And third, all natural cap capital, including our energy, which today comes from fossil sources, um, may only be used to that extent as they can be regenerated. So that's a very bold w vision in which wealth is created while its natural systems thrive. Professor Braungart, a German uh, chemist, sort of he calls it the ant economy. Ants uh, account for something like uh, 30 billion human beings, uh, if you take all of them on the planet in terms of their calorie intake or in terms of uh, uh, the biomass that they constitute. And still, it's fair to argue that any ant colony is anything between neutral or very, very positive uh, towards its surrounding ecosystems. There is no overpopulation with ants. So attaining that ant, ant economy on a philo philosophical level requires us to do three things. Uh, we need to learn to honor diversification of a specialization again, well, we need to learn to think in systems, and we need to learn to collaborate and share benefits in much more sophisticated ways than we do today. For the business sector, in a much more practical way, uh, the rules are appropriately simple. First, we must manage the uh, purity and integrity uh, of our materials. And we need to start feeling very uneasy on a pyjama jacket uh, that contains a lot of leachable flame retardants. Second, we need to drive utilization of any assets and we need to start feeling very uneasy about a power drill that is only used for three minutes a year, which is the average. And third, we need to sell performance, not products. We need to sell kilometers, not tires. We need to sell uh, mobility, not automobiles. We need to sell connectivity, not uh, iPhones. And we need to sell um, health and not food. And we need to feel uneasy if our current business model is unable to monetize the performance that we are providing to our customers. The vision is very attractive indeed. Dream of a business where uh, you are completely protected against resource shocks, where you have very short and resilient supply chains, uh, where you have a lot of customer retention and intimacy, uh, where you have the advantages of much cheaper component and material costs, uh, and where you are smiled upon by regulators, which is always uh, a good thing. And I'd like to make the point that, uh, in essence, this world is drawing nearer. Um, with every shared car, with every biodegradable, biodegradable coffee cup we are using, uh, with every uh, sharing platform uh, on the web, um, with every pay per lux contract, like in the Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm, and with every kilogram of phosphorus uh, retained or recovered uh, from wastewater. So how exactly would the circular and regenerative economy then look like for water sectors. So let me come to my third point. Let us explore how the circular design of the economy would be an unprecedented opportunity for the water sector. So bear with me for a moment. Uh, I think it's first of all an intellectually quite energizing uh, effort. And secondly, it's a complete eye opener to see how the most circular of materials or commodities of all, how we have linearized it and pushed it down an end of pipe system. Um, and let's all, it's also a wonderful eye-opener how essential the water sector really is in that transition. Uh, however, we need to be a, a bit structural and discriminating before we get started. I think we need to take uh, three 
or we can take three different perspectives when we think about water and the circular economy. The first one is the resource perspective, where we are thinking about how to balance uh, withdrawals and returns. Secondly, we need to think about uh, the product perspective and think about how we want to use water as a consumable or as a durable, which today we don't do at all. And thirdly, we need to think about the utility perspective of how we can make maximum value out of the infrastructure assets that we have deployed in very innovative ways. So let me start with a resource perspective and explore how regenerated consumption would play out for that. Water can come to us as a stock or as a flow. So let's start with a stock. Uh, I've been working very heavily in, um, on the agricultural system in Saudi Arabia, and unfortunately to them, water comes as a stock. Uh, 16 BCM out of 18 are from non-renewable um, uh, fossil aquifers, um, which very soon in a business as usual um, scenario will be depleted in something like 20 to 30 years. So evidently you need to move uh, um, to the renewable aquifers, a few of them exist that can be recharged. You need to move to grey water usage in agriculture and you need to move to innovative things such like sea uh, water irrigation uh, or uh, moist uh, harvesting. Luckily, in most regions, uh, we, uh, water comes to us as a flow, be it a replenishable uh, aquifer or be it um, a river so that self-yields can in fact be withdrawn and returned or we can even consume water to the extent that we are observing replenishment rates or the environmental flows of our rivers. Uh, I think that you can't be more circular than investing into the vitality of a watershed, of a basin. Um, and that uh, the journey that we are, have observed from Catskill to uh, Bogota um, of uh, using uh, and capitalizing on the ecosystem services is in fact uh, an opportunity, an arbitrage opportunity, green infrastructure that we've only started to scratch the surface of. And, I, and you are absolutely circular uh, if you're trying uh, to balance demand in a basin, and that requires you to take advantage of all the technology available from, uh, from drip irrigation, irrigation scheduling, uh, LEED, building, <coughs> building codes, uh, or things uh, like dry dedusting of steel. Second, we can take a product perspective and consider water as a product that is uh, processed, enriched, and then delivered. In a truly circular economy, uh, we also have to apply the same strict rules that we would have to apply to any other product. Sometimes we would opt to treat water as, uh, in a <coughs> as something that operates in a closed loop, and we would treat it like a durable. We would always do that uh, if if it is too valuable to be returned, like in the case of uh, the pearl gas liquid uh, complex in Qatar, or if it's, if it's too costly to recreate in the case of uh, uh, an electroplating bath for, uh, or uh, the, the alkaline uh, heavy duty cleaning liquids, uh, water would remain uh, in a closed loop and it will be refurbished or, uh, or uh, refabricated again and again and you would only operate it in a zero liquid, uh, under zero liquid uh, discharge condition, conditions. And sometimes we will opt to take or use water as a consumable um, and to keep it very pure, that is important. Uh, we should only bring water into solution or into suspension with materials that can very easily be taken out again uh, or at a benefit, uh, at, a, at a profit. And we can't mix it with estrogenic hormones, we can't mix it uh, with the toxic ink of bad toilet, toilet paper, and we can't mix it with textile dyes. And we should use it in cascades and uh, extract as much energy and as much uh, nutrients from the water and in the end we should be reusing water itself. Currently in front of our eyes we are witnessing a revolution of our ability to extract value from used water. The ability to extract energy um, it is today commercially viable uh, to generate heat and power out of uh, wastewater um, using thermal hydrolysis as uh, witnessed in the uh, Billund biorefinery complex. 
our ability uh, to extract nutrients. We can, for, uh, for example, recover um, potassium hydro uh, hydroxide, which is used, uh, used to neutralize um, hydrofluoric acid um, in uh, uh, alkaline uh, units. Uh, and as you do that, uh, in fact, you can reduce the potassium hydroxide cost by something as a feedstock to, to for, your, uh, for your process uh, by something like 75%. Or we can extract PHA, which is a biodegradable polymer, which has the same properties as uh, petroleum-based uh, polyolefins. Um, and so increasingly, we are and we must be moving from, um, uh, from removal to recovery. Uh, we should move from cleaning water from ammonium towards the production of ammonium sulfate fertilizer. And lastly, our ability to reuse water. We are witnessing a significant improvement in our ability uh, to treat water uh, in a membrane-based fashion. Um, and reused water starts to be big business, business at scale. So uh, gray water is a big deal in countries like uh, Saudi Arabia. There are huge uh, investment programs uh, in the back of gray water use, uh, all the way towards new water schemes like in Singapore. However, more important, I would argue, than our ability to treat and to return safely is the ability uh, to introduce systems of source separation. We need to be able to separate industry-grade and household-grade bl uh, bl black or yellow water uh, and to make sure we don't have contamination and mixing in the first place. And this is, let me emphasize this, this is very important. Um, we should truly celebrate our ability to treat and safely return but if we really want to be honest and if we really want to be truly circular, uh, then we need to stop impurity and contamination of water in the first place. And this is also a character test to the utility industry. So that leads to a third perspective, the utility perspective. Our networks and our tre uh, treatment uh, plants uh, represent a capital addition every year of 150 billion US dollars. And something like 10 to 50% of our national energy bills go straight into the water sector. Uh, circularity reminds us to maximize the benefits over any unit of deployed assets. How can we do that? Utilities should consider using and utilizing their assets for more services than just water. Why not using it as a collection conduit for food waste? Why not uh, offer uh, the ditches and the trenches uh, for fiber installation? Um, why not use the data for um, uh, health management or for flood management? Uh, New York City, for example, announced that they will be, through their sewage systems, be collecting um, 500 tons of food waste uh, from next year onwards and in their uh, Newton Creek wastewater treatment plant that is converted into enough heat to uh, <coughs> to supply 5,200 New York city homes. Utilities should sell performance, not water. They should help their customers to save water and they should differentiate, uh, differentiate the service and the convenience and the pricing levels that they are offer to their customers. Utilities should start establish asset recovery centers and asset recovery practices, to, uh, and they should start standardizing their pipes and their meters and their equipment so that it can have a next life. And they should start introducing asset tracking systems that, that, so that for every piece of equipment, you know what is the highest value route into the piece of equipment's next life. And finally, utilities should invest into ever more efficient operations, uh, and they should use uh, um, renewable energy, green energy, ideally uh, self-generated. Um, and there are many examples of how anaerobic digestion is already able to cover 60% of the energy bill of your wastewater treatment plant operation. So there is an explosion of new technological solutions, applications of... Uh, um, pilots uh, and initiatives. Uh, and this development is driven by innovators, by responsible operators, or by uh, system developers uh, highly committed, such as Veolia. Many of those technologies are already in the money, or they will soon be, like the bespoke um, biopolymers that can actually be taken out of the biological digestion process for wastewater. 
Vapor transfer is a different, is a similar example where, in fact, you can transfer um, vapor through very low-cost plastic tubes to the plant. So a solute or um, a liquid will not make it through that pipe, and so you are in fact able uh, to use seawater for the irrigation of plants. Um, let's take all of this together now. Uh, there is a new capability emerging to manage the water sector very differently, both technologically and institutionally. Most of these applications, however, continue to be very niche. So what is needed to stay abreast uh, of the resource challenge is a massive systematic step up over the next 10 to 20 years. So the question that I want to put out is what are the attractive integrated plays for the sector to play? And let me offer five ideas. First, product design partnerships. Even in 2014, think about it, there is still no structured dialogue between the producers, let's say, of an atrocyne herbicide or of detergent metabolites or antimicrobial disinfectants and the wastewater operator on the other side of the pipe. The relationship is still that of a distant source and a sink and the accountability is about as diluted as the substance is uh, to be treated. Uh, but as the cost of treatment mounts and as we are getting stricter on producer responsibility and as traceability is getting easier, I think there is a real opportunity to wastewater treatment players to, be, to offer their expertise to the producers of products at the other end of the pipe. Second, resource positive utilities. Wastewater utilities are ubiquitous, um, they're very visible and they are, with all due respect, not too dissimilar. Given the technological opportunity of sludge methanization, uh, waste heat recovery or on-site distributed power generation, water utilities should become the quintessential prosumer, they should all go energy positive. So who will champion that movement uh, at scale of wastewater to energy, grid integration and nutrient recovery? Third, manage for yield. It's something I'm very passionate about. Water is a very powerful driver of yield in industrial processes. Uh, improved site level water management can improve the yield in food and beverage by 5% or it can improve the productivity of an oil well by 20%. And that is money that falls straight down to the bottom line. That is, that is a lot of value uh, to companies. Add to that the benefits of uh, um, better dosing of chemicals and less, lot, uh, less loss of, uh, of energy put into the water. Water can make a remarkable uh, transition from being um, a, a fringe input towards a major driver of value within uh, uh, a production process. We've recently been working for a client whose uh, profit, whose total margin we could improve by seven percentage point simply by improving the yield and, uh, of water and by looking at water not as this thing that is a driving footprint, but by looking at water as a carrier uh, and a driver, of <coughs> a driver of value. So who will help industry uh, to tap that opportunity? Fourth, basin management. As I said, from the Catskill to Bogota and from Evian uh, to Quito, flood plan protection is discovered as a very viable path to reduce the costs and to reduce the risk of fresh water provision. The ecosystem services revolution, however, is stuck simply because it requires very complex multi-stakeholder contracts and a lot of depths in hydrology and in engineering. Um, so who will be the market maker for the ecosystem services market? and make sure that companies and cities are able to capture that part of the arbitrage. And lastly, local organic nutrient cycles. Every community that I'm aware of is struggling with low quality um, sludge uh, and with the very fragmented and contaminated stream of organic waste. Um, the food and beverage industry is getting increasingly under pressure over this for food waste. Um, and uh, Agriculture is increasingly looking for new nutrient to close their fertilizer gap. Organic flows 
I'm convinced, need to be recommoditized and they need to be localized. So who will it be that is creating and managing the local organic nutrient cycle? Every single trust, I believe, uh, is a huge strategic opportunity. Uh, and it's also a chance to reposition the water sector um, as uh, to a new generation of high school graduates, which will be knocking at your door as eco-designers, power engineers, yield managers, uh, ecosystem service marketeers, or syngas tycoons. I think that's not a bad message to, sp uh, to spread amongst the graduate community. Let me summarize. The diagnosis is alarming. Uh, we have to take one billion people out of poverty and integrate three billion into our global uh, economy as middle class consumers at a moment where we are already operating outside our safe operating space. The therapy calls uh, for a step change in resource productivity uh, and we need a new model that is circular and restorative by design. Water is the single most important uh, commodity uh, <coughs> and resource across all our supply chains. And wastewater, also importantly, is the single biggest waste category as big as all solid waste uh, taken uh, together. So water is the natural starting point uh, for the circular economy. For the water sector, being at the center <coughs> um, is quite credible. It's in the center of the nexus. Uh, it's very cross-sectoral as a sector. Um, it's being well up on the technology curves. We have not been dreaming with any of this. All of this is, exists in terms of technology. Uh, and the water sector is a proven broker between multi-stakeholder interests. I think it's a unique opportunity. So what would success look like? We would have technology and processes in place that allow us to uh, create the maximum utility out of every drop of water, be it calories, be it heat, be it cold, be it movement. We have entirely separated circles, a durable water circle and a consumable water circle. We have ensured that nothing is mixed into the consumable water that cannot be extracted without a benefit. And we have all of these loops established on community, industry, company and household level. With all that in place, I truly believe we can stop saving water, cleaning wastewater, and operating uh, <coughs> wastewater utilities. So and if you believe that all of this is too far out or too difficult, at least at a min minimum, tell your children that water has been circulating for millions of years, providing plenty to all. <coughs> if we don't get it right, trust me, they will. <coughs>